Hi guys, in this episode of Planet Stock Zone, I'm gonna be sharing my thoughts on the 15th episode of the 11th season of what is one of my favorite shows ever, The Walking Dead. And again, just like with the last few episodes, the trend continues. This episode definitely wasn't as enjoyable and as uh, entertaining as last episode, though uh, I actually still enjoyed it quite a lot. It just definitely felt like it was dragging at times and I was uh, feeling like can we move on and get to the actual entertaining stuff uh, of the episode so it definitely had that weakerness uh, to it compared to the previous episode so the trend continues but that means that the finale uh, or the mid-season finale should I say the 16th episode is actually going to be a pretty exciting one if the trend continues to go through which so far it has been the case so uh, there is that. But still, we got some really, really cool stuff in this episode and a really, really cool moment that I'm sure uh, you know what I'm talking about. But before we get into that moment, which was definitely the uh, the peak of this episode, uh, we obviously have to go through uh, everything in this episode a little bit at least. I'm not going to be rec recapping it. Uh, uh, like I used to, like you've seen how I've been doing the reviews uh, in the last uh, six or seven episodes. So again, we're gonna be doing that. But to be honest, for this episode, I don't really know where to kind of start it because we got uh, a couple of very disconnected stories. Like the main story of the episode is definitely the Maggie and uh, uh, Darrow and uh, Lance stuff at Hilltop. But we still got uh, some continuation of certain stories like Eugene and Max, um, uh, the behind the scenes stuff that uh, Sebastian and Lance are doing and the disappearance of people and that Tyler Davis guy who got his butt kicked by Princess. We also got a little bit of Mercer in this episode. So we got a few uh, stories that were continuing being moved um, in this episode. Um, but it was a little bit different from the way uh, those kind of multiple stories at a time were done in previous episodes. To the point where this episode gave me some really strong Gimpo vibes. Like this genuinely kind of felt like a Gimpo episode. You had your slow burn scenes uh, uh, where I feel like I'm kind of being a little bored. You had your really good... Gimpo speak like speech with Ezekiel when he's talking to Carol cl close to the end of the episode and you had your peak of the action moment uh, uh, in the episode which is again like the peak of the episode you also had some really cool action which Gimpo even in like the bad seasons I still think he did it pretty cool like the action was still kind of satisfying and I know it was like the rule of cool kind of thing that was applying to those action scenes, but they were still exciting. Like, it definitely gave me the same kind of feeling like I felt uh, in those scenes. And talking about action stuff, I guess let's just get that uh, off of uh, uh, the list first. Uh, that being the scene where Lance makes uh, Aaron and Gabriel kill the walkers that he and the troopers from, uh, uh, from the Commonwealth... Uh, meet when they're walking towards Hilltop, they're traveling towards Hilltop. Um, and I really like that sequence because for the first time in a while we actually got zombie kills front and center. I mean one of the kills was still to the side a little bit and uh, the other one was a little bit further away but I really liked uh, the kill that Gabriel did to the walker where he slashed his head, that was really nice. Uh, it looked really good in my eyes, but I just like that whole sequence with Aaron uh, hitting it, uh, the walker in the face and its head exploding, Gabriel slashing the head of that uh, walker and Darrow stabbing one walker with the gun, uh, moving it towards uh, another walker and shooting a bullet. And then afterwards when he kicks the head of the walker towards uh, Lance and says, Saved you a bullet. Like, that was really cool. There were so many moments in this episode where Dario was, like, really cool and so defiant of uh, Lance and uh, the Commonwealth army in general. Because, like, even in the beginning when Lance uh, questions uh, Aaron and Gabriel about what happened at that location, which felt a little bit of, la like, a lazy way of expositioning uh, to us that Lance actually knows what happened last episode and also kind of recapping 
uh, what happened last episode, but I still feel like it makes sense. Like, I think they made it make sense, but it was, like, a little obvious. If I managed to kind of be like, wow, they're really, uh, uh, doing that as you know, uh, uh, exposition thing. Uh, in this episode, but it was still nice. But in that scene when he's questioning uh, Gabriel and Aaron, uh, and he's kind of walking closer to them as they're standing close to the edge, which, by the way, why the fuck are they standing so close to the edge? I really, really don't um, uh, understand that. Why do they stand so close to the edge when they can, where they can easily be pushed? I can see it from like a writing perspective. Why would you put them there to create tension that they could possibly get pushed? Uh, especially by Lance, but it doesn't make sense for them to stand there because why would you? And also, I'm not sure whether it was in this episode. I, I think it makes sense for it to be in this episode because uh, Toby died in last episode. So in the beginning of this episode, we do get some really gory close look to his eaten up body. And boy, does it look so good. I don't know what happened for this episode, but they really didn't hold back when it came to the gore. Like, it was really good. In a way that we haven't uh, seen it in a while. Like, oh, I, I love me some gore like that, man. I, I, I like it when The Walking Dead does not hold back in that regard. Fear The Walking Dead, I feel like, has been uh, better uh, in Season 6 and 7 in that regard. Uh, although there was definitely some weird moments uh, around the middle of, like, the uh, COVID stuff. But... Uh, it's been better, and I want The Walking Dead to also get better. It got better in Season 9, for sure, but then for Season 10 and 11 so far, it's been kind of lackluster with the gore again. So I'm glad that this episode had a lot of gore like that. But again, I'm, I'm getting a little bit sidetracked. In that scene when Lance is talking to Aaron and Gabriel, uh, you can see Daryl feel like there's a possibility that he might push them off the edge. So he kind of walks closer to Lance. And even the Commonwealth soldiers behind Daryl notice that. So they also kind of move closer because they're considering that maybe he's going to do something. And Daryl also notices that. And that was a really, really nice moment where it's just the visual storytelling. It was really, gr uh, really good. And after, right after that... Um, uh, Lance uh, pulls away and sa says that he believes them. Um, and I love how uh, uh, he asks Daryl whether uh, whether he thinks that what they're saying is the truth. And I feel like we got a very reminiscent scene of this at some point, either last season or earlier this season, where... Daryl again was asked about something and he lied through his teeth like that. I don't know if it was when he was like uh, captured by the Reapers or something there, I'm not sure. I, I, I guess it might have been um, when he was being interrogated by Leah, but it, very, it felt very uh, similar to something. And I just don't know the exact scene where uh, they're pulling that from, but I, I really like that. So, obviously, then, uh, they decide to go to Hilltop. And we get some really, really tense scenes on Hilltop, man. Uh, the tension in this episode was insane. Uh, obviously, the scene that we have with, like, Daryl saying uh, that... Uh, with Maggie saying that it doesn't have to be this way, but Daryl replying that, yeah, it does when they go to Hilltop. It obviously has more context to it uh, in this episode, and it was always going to be, like, a fake out. Uh, seen earlier, but he very much proved himself that he's still on the side of the good guys uh, in this episode. Like he, he, he like he said in uh, that earlier episode when Maggie and uh, uh, Pamela met for the first time, when she asked, uh, when Maggie asked Daryl, "Why do you trust these people?" and Daryl replied, "Who says we do? I mean, when do I ever?" It shows that. Daryl is doing this just for uh, Judith and RJ, and not because he genuinely believes in the Commonwealth or anything. And it's honestly kind of weird, but also cool that Daryl continues to not really wear his uniform most of the time, or he always stands out in some way from the rest uh, of the group. Like, he is always... Uh, 
obviously different from them. But not enough uh, like Mercer, I guess. Because uh, like in most of this episode, uh, when you see him at Hilltop or when you see him in the beginning of the episode, he's not wearing uh, his armor at all, he's just wearing black clothes. Uh, and even when they're walking towards Hilltop, he's wearing the armor, but he doesn't have the neck piece and uh, he doesn't wear the helmet, it seems like. I guess that is kind of as a way to show us uh, uh, where his allegiance uh, lays, but yeah, I don't know. So the second that Lance goes to Hilltop, like the tension is through the roof because we know that Maggie... Uh, took uh, in those people and they have to hide them. It definitely, I guess one of the reasons why it reminded me of the Gimpo episodes is because we're back at Hilltop, we're some, again hiding from some bad guys uh, who have come to look for for our characters. And it felt very reminiscent of the days when Dario and Maggie had to hide in Hilltop from the saviors. And see how the turntables, now uh, Negan is the one uh, who uh, who has to hide at Hilltop from somebody looking for uh, to kill him. Like, that is a really nice detail. But, like, the tension is through the roof in that whole sequence. Especially with, like, the car where uh, Lance finds... Uh, I think it's the car that was at the location which Maggie used to drive uh, to there. Uh, but she lies that it's... Uh, that it's not working, that she's trying to make it work. Lance kind of uh, decides to bite uh, into what Maggie is saying and tr uh, says that he can fix it because his family is full of gearheads. And he plugs in a cable and he thinks he has it, but the car still doesn't start. And that scene where he's he thinks he has caught her he, and he's just waiting for the star for the car to start to order for her to be shot or something. Like, it's so goddamn tense. Though, I do want to say, can Maggie and Daryl and the rest be more obvious with their lies? Like, I know that we as viewers know that they're lying. And we as viewers can focus more on their actual facial expressions and stuff. But it's so blatant that they're hiding something. Like, just look at Maggie. Like, she gets stressed when Lance is in the car and he's trying to start it. She very obviously gets stressed. So does Daryl. And you can see in their faces that they're both planning on what to do if the car does start. But luckily it doesn't. But that still doesn't stop Lance because later on he uh, uh, catches uh, Herschel uh, after he leaves his dad's grave, which pretty cool comeback, uh, callback. And he takes a hat that was found at the scene uh, where uh, Toby was killed, like where the people were surviving, and puts it on Herschel's head, and it fits him perfectly. Um, and obviously, uh, afterwards, he gets attacked by Elijah, who pushes him to the wall for touching Herschel and threatening him, and then she goes down. Uh, everybody is uh, angry, everybody is uh, uh, gung-ho and pulls up their guns. And man, that whole sequence is so masterful, from the sound, like the 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 background music is so tense and i just love the, the both the lines that maggie says but also dario's lines because like maggie says many people have uh tried to threaten my family most of them are dead now or something along those lines well, i'm paraphrasing a little bit but it sounds really badass coming from her especially with like how protective she is of Herschel, like, she's ready to blow his head off. And Daryl also with his goddamn badass line where he says, you've turned this place around and you found nothing. So if you don't want to die for nothing, uh, tell your guys, to, uh, tell everyone to put their guns down before something really fucking bad happens. And boy did that hit fucking hard, man. I did not expect that F-bomb at all. And I'm honestly in two minds about the Walking Dead uh, universe using fuck uh, F-bombs. Because when they do, it's really fucking cool. It really is cool. And it hits harder, so much harder. Um, although if they gave the ability for Negan to say fuck, 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 fuck all the time... Um, it definitely ends up being too much. Because I've seen the uncensored version of that scene... But it just comes off 
comical rather than threatening. I feel like the uh, actual scene that we got in the episode is much more scary because it's clear that this guy's kind of holding back his anger a little bit so that kind of make, makes it more threatening you know because he is really mad about rick and co killing his people so yeah i mean two minds about it because when they use it it's really cool but the fact that they use it so rarely amplifies the fact that it's cool because off the top of my head the times where the word fuck has been used in actual episodes is two in the main show at least in season nine episode four when Dario and Rick are in the hole um Dario uses fuck and now again Dario uses the word fuck uh there's also uh that uh a, I don't know whether it was censored or it was just shot the way it was shot so they didn't have to sh reshoot the scene twice but uh, in the first episode of the 10C episodes, like episode 17 of season 10, in the beginning when we uh, have Maggie and Negan see for the first time in a long time, uh, as Maggie is walking away, Negan says, well, shit. But his mouth clearly says, fuck. And I don't know why they dubbed it, is it because maybe they wanted to have that scene a have fuck for like the Blu-ray and they didn't want to reshoot the scene again? Or maybe uh, they were some, uh, uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan was supposed to say uh, shit, but he said fuck and they just redubbed it later. I don't know, but it's clear that he says fuck. And for me, canonically, he says fuck because in that situation, it, it feels more uh, cool for him to say fuck because it's also funny because he was just getting closer to everybody and redeeming himself and now Maggie comes up and he has to start that shit all over again. But yeah, I really like that f bomb in this episode. It was so badass as well and the, the, the sentence itself is badass. Where Daryl tells him that if he doesn't want to die for nothing, it, like it's so fucking badass. You can't get more badass than that in my eyes. I really enjoyed that scene. It was so cool. So afterwards, obviously, uh, they decide to leave. And it turns out that they're not going to be going back to the Commonwealth until they find the guns. But actually, luckily, they actually do find them at the end of the episode. In nobody else's hands except Leah's. Who, stupidly, by the way, uh, comes out of hiding when uh, Lance... Uh, just wants says that he just wants to talk to her because she clearly has the upper hand because she has put um, kind of a trap uh, for them and even sh uh, shoots two of the soldiers but then when he says that he just wants to talk to her she just kind of walks onto the scene from god knows where why would you do that because if you're actually going to shoot them uh, and you're not going to agree to what he uh, offers you then now you're at a major disadvantage because there's like five soldiers pointing the guns at you and then there's you, the one person, whereas you were hiding before and you had the advantage and you could have still listened to what he had to say. But yeah. So I guess uh, she is getting hired by, uh, uh, by Lance to kill Maggie. I assume. It's really... Seem, seems like it's gonna be that way, but I've seen some people speculate that he might be hiring her to kill Pamela, and I can definitely see them doing that because saying uh, uh, that he wants to see uh, in like the preview for the next episode, he says to Leah that he wants to see her face afterwards. You can it, it it can easily be made to be like a fake out where they're making you think that it's Maggie that he wants to kill, but it's actually Pamela. Uh, I can definitely see the Walking Dead do that. They definitely love doing that shit. So part of me definitely is leaning towards uh, the possibility of Pamela being the target, but I feel like it just makes sense for it to be Maggie considering what happened in last episode and everything. Yeah, I don't know. Because at the end of the day, uh, would it uh, make sense for Lance to hold a grudge onto Maggie when she truly wasn't the one who took the guns, but it was Leah? Like, I don't know. 
Now that I think about it, it makes much more sense for Lance to want to kill Pamela and not Maggie, but then why would Leah care about that? Because she definitely cares about killing Maggie for what she did to her people, but still, I don't know. I do want to say though, I predict that there's a big likelihood that Annie is going to die. Although I do hope that Annie dies bef uh, after she gives birth to Negan's baby. Which, by the way, I, pr I offer, I suggest the baby's name to be called Lucy. I don't know uh, whether it's going to be a boy or a girl, um, but let's call it Lucy. Lucifer, if it's a boy, and Lucy, if it's a girl. So in both cases, it's Lucy. And uh, it's uh, named after Negan's former wife, which might be awkward for Annie to call uh, their child after his former wife. But I feel like, considering she understands uh, why he killed Glenn and she uh, accepts that, I feel like she would accept something like that as well. But yeah, I feel like there's, there might be a big likelihood that... Uh, uh, that Annie is going to die, but again, I really hope that she dies after she gives birth to the child, because it would be really fucking dumb to have Annie as a love interest for Negan, and even ha go as far as to say that she's pregnant with Negan's baby only to kill her, but they're clearly kind of attempting to do something that would make Negan and Maggie kind of equivalent, where Negan killed Maggie's husband, and... Now uh, their child is without a father. Uh, in the meantime, Negan has his new wife and his new kid. And he gets to have the happy family, but Mike doesn't. I feel like with, with the Walking Dead being the way it is, one of the parents is gonna die. And I don't see Negan dying. But I feel like uh, there's a big likelihood that Annie might actually die before giving birth. Because the Walking Dead loves killing cool things like that. Oh, uh, it, lo it, it loves teasing us with cool things like that. Oh, you want to have Negan with a child? Too bad, we just wasted that storyline for nothing. But again, I'm not gonna go into complaining it about it before it actually happens. So yeah, that was for the Hilltop storyline. We got a bunch more storylines in this episode, like, uh, like I said, the continuation of uh, the uh, mystery surrounding the disappearance of that... Uh, uh, Commonwealth soldier Tyler Davis, who was demoted after Princess kicked his ass. Uh, with this episode, inf the information about uh, what happened uh, with uh, Maggie and Dario in the previous episode, where they had to take the money from the safe being uh, given to Max, who I guess is now officially on the good side, and also they're officially a couple with Eugene because they had their first kiss in this episode. Um, we also had a little bit of a I don't know, more stuff with, like, Princess and Mercer. Like, I feel like this is the most Mercer has gotten, like, as a character on his own, uh, without the inclusion of, like, the other main characters. This is... There was actual focus on uh, Mercer in this episode uh, with uh, his relationship with Princess, which I really like the relationship. Uh, they're really cute together. But I guess the, the other really cool storyline in this episode was definitely the Ezekiel one. Uh, where now that he has been uh, fixed, like he doesn't have the cancer anymore, it seems like. Uh, and after the words that uh, Carol said to him about him not being a lesser man, he has decided to actually do something good uh, with the time that he has been given. Which, by the way, I just want to say, his death is so fucking telegraphed in this episode. Like, I know that... Uh, uh, Angela Khan doesn't do shit like this. But The Walking Dead has trained me for years to expect for a character to die the second they try they start planning for the future and talking about the future. It's just what fucking happens, man. Because that is the easiest way to make us feel the worst about that character's death because he was just kind of setting up his life for the future and now he's dead. Or she's dead. So... With that kind of training and programming that I have instilled in me, I really expected uh, for him to get randomly killed in this episode. Like, literally, when he was talking to Carol at the end of the episode and was giving that big speech, I literally expected for a Commonwealth soldier to show up into that location where they were illegally helping uh, people's health and to shoot him. 
I genuinely expected for that to happen. Just because of how um, The Walking Dead has kind of set my expectations. But again, Angela Kang has definitely used that programming to uh, to her advantage when she's writing uh, The Walking Dead. Because there have been so many fake outs at this point. Like, remember Jerry in the cave? Like, even the music kind of swelled and was becoming very emotional uh, when there was the possibility of him get, uh, getting stuck and dying in that cave. But he didn't die. Um, uh, similarly, I feel like we have had similar foreboding moments for other characters as, as well, but it was really telegraphed in this episode. And I'm also worried a little bit about um, Judith and RJ after this episode, because Caro seems to be the one taking care of them, at least in the moment, because Darrow is off uh, on a mission with the Commonwealth soldiers, uh, and she was the one sh who took them to school. Which was weird, by the way, to see them going to school. It's kind of crazy. Remember in, like, what was it, season two? When we got a flashback to when uh, Carol and Lori found out about Rick getting shot in a flashback? It's crazy how far we've come. It's been ten years. But it's still so insane, man. I remember when I first started the wa watching the, wa the Walking Dead back in 2016. It's insane. How far we've come. And boy is it going to be a journey. Rewatching the show when it, once it's done. Which by the way. I'm literally recording this video. On the day that they. Had their final shooting. Uh, of, of a scene. Like officially they've shot it. At this point. Which is kind of uh, sad. A little bit. But to be honest. I can't really feel too sad. Because. For all intents and purposes, it's still continuing because we have two spin-offs with four of the, what, five or eight uh, main characters, depending on how far you want to go. So half the cast is getting spin-offs. Then there's Tales of the Walking Dead, which by its nature is going to be a show that could easily reuse old characters. Hell, we're getting an alpha episode in uh, Tales of the Walking Dead Season 1. Um... There's a speculation, but I'm not sure whether it's confirmed that we're getting a Tyrese episode. There was a rumor that we're going to be getting a Jesus episode as well, because also Tom Payne was uh, seen recently with like his uh, long hair, like his Jesus hair. So I feel like there's a big likelihood that we're going to get at least those three episodes, plus some new stuff. So in the future, we could easily get an episode based on Aaron or uh, an episode based on Rosita. And... I genuinely uh, cannot, uh, can, I wouldn't believe if the, okay, how to say it? I genuinely would be surprised if The Walking Dead does not do The Walking Dead Generations at some point. If the spin-offs continue to be happening and maybe the spin-offs of like Darren Carroll and Negan and Maggie actually kind of blow up or maybe Tales of The Walking Dead blows up a little bit. Like, it's very unlikely uh, for them to not actually go for the Walking Dead Generations route as well, because it just makes sense to do something like that. Although, I also want to mention that there has been some rumors that there's a possibility that uh, AMC might do uh, um, a spin-off uh, about Rick and Michonne instead of the movies, because it seems like the movies are in development hell at this point. Um, so, to be honest, any kind of uh, completion of that story arc, I'll be fine with. Because uh, I feel like in the first place, going for a movie type thing would have been uh, too much because... Uh, maybe even impossible, because for the movie to be good and enjoyed by everybody, you have to make it accessible to both new fans, uh, or new people, and existing fans. Because this, it's kind of impossible to watch the movie without having seen like the previous nine seasons of the TV show. So I would be fine if they do a spin-off as well. Imagine having uh, three spin-offs. Negan Maggie, uh, Daryl Carroll and Rick and Michelle. Might as well bring back the show at that point. Although I guess maybe having three shows could allow for a bigger budget overall. Because with three shows, you get more ads uh, for those three shows. So yeah, like I said earlier, uh, the second most interesting plot of the episode was definitely the Ezekiel stuff. With uh, him uh, 
deciding to help people in need who are not in front uh, seat of like the the system which allows uh, them to go and get healthcare. Because like Ezekiel was like very last, like close to, to last place, but because of Carol and her working with uh, uh, Lance, he got to the first spot. And he kind of wants to help other people at the same time, and he employs uh, uh, Tommy to help him with that. And uh, I'm glad that Tommy actually had a little bit of a bigger role in this episode, although I was really worried about him in this episode as well, because The Walking Dead doesn't have a really good track record with doctors, usually they die. And I feel like there's a very big likelihood that he's gonna die before the end of the show. Um, but I really hope he doesn't. If I had to choose who's gonna die between Yumiko and uh, Tommy, I definitely would prefer Yumiko to die, because she was the one who pushed him into this situation right now, where he's forced to work and... Uh, uh, operate on people, because that is not what he wanted before the zombie apocalypse even happened, and he doesn't want it now either, even though, yeah, he's a doctor, and his role is important in a community like that, but I feel like it's better for them to actually employ him in some way to us uh, to teach others how to do those stuff instead of forcing him to save them, because it's clearly not good for him. And while I get the greater good argument and all, should it cost somebody's life and individuality and freedom for that? I, I disagree, and that's why I personally hate communism. Because that feels like a very communist idea to me. Like, sure, communism has its good ideas here and there, like more power to the people and everything. Um, and the destruction of the state, essentially, but I don't like the kind of lack of personal freedom and personal responsibility. Like, sure, it, it, he should help, but it should be out of his own violation, and he clearly doesn't want to do that. So why not instead use him to teach others instead of forcing him to suffer and to throw his life away just for everybody else's benefit? Like, I disagree with that sentiment. If something doesn't make you happy, even if it helps other people, you shouldn't have to do it. And it clearly hurt, is hurting him right now because uh, he was drinking in the beginning both alcohol and pills, so I'm curious where they're gonna go with his story right now. But I'm glad that he was happy at least helping the people in need uh, towards the end of the episode. So it's all not bad. Uh, it's not all bad with him. But yeah. I don't really have as much to talk about when it comes to this episode uh, overall, and it definitely, like I said, wasn't as interesting as the previous episode. Like, you can even see in my notes that I definitely wrote much less for it, but it was still enjoyable and I still liked it, and it's definitely gonna be a fine episode once I'm rewatching it. I'll probably uh, be doing uh, re reviews uh, of all these episodes whenever I get to rewatch the show, because once the main show is done, I'm 100% re-watching it. Because I, not only because I want to review um, all the episodes uh, from before I started doing these reviews, but I also want to see how uh, my enjoyment for like season 9, season 10, and season 11 uh, change when I'm binging them compared to when I was watching them weekly. Because I feel like with The Walking Dead, it's always felt like it was meant to be a, a binged show. It's always felt better when binged and more entertaining and more immersive when it's binged. And it's always felt like a chore to watch it weekly. Or at least most of the time it feels like that. Because I feel like with season 9, a lot of the episodes, the individual episodes of the season, were actually pretty entertaining. And uh, it didn't feel like I was like... Uh, not satisfied week to week, like it felt very exciting, and uh, I don't know why that kind of disappeared in season 10, because it definitely wasn't as excited from week to week, but it, that's how it happened, you know. But yeah, um, before we get into my rating for this episode though, let's go through my notes. So yeah, literally the first thing that I wrote is also one of the first things that I talked about, why stand at the edge of the building? It just doesn't make any sense for the two characters to stand there. Like, why?
yeah, I also mentioned this, uh, Dario ready to kill Hornsby, so I'm not gonna really elaborate on that. Um, next thing I've written is, when was the last time The Walking Dead talked about sex so openly? And yeah, I kind of forgot to talk about this, which is in the scene between Mercer and Princess in, in early in the episode when uh, they wake up together after sleeping together and everything. And it's just the openness of the talking about sex. You don't really get that um, in The Walking Dead that much, at least not so explicitly. It's kind of funny when you think about it. Gore, death, murder, all fine. But God forbid you say fuck or you show sex on screen. Like, I feel like the most sexual scenes that we've seen on the show were with Glenn and Maggie, maybe, and a little bit of Rick and Michonne. But since both of those couples haven't been a thing since season 9 uh, at the latest with, like, uh, Rick and Michonne and season 6 with Glenn and Maggie, we haven't really had much of that sexual stuff, really. So, yeah. It's, it's, it was kind of refreshing to hear that shit. Um, next thing I've written is, Ezekiel is so gonna die one way or another. Because it felt very telegraphed. In literally everything he was talking about, the fact that now he's alive and now he has more, more time to live. And how is that not blatant foreshadowing that he's gonna die? I don't know. So the next thing I've written is, I love Daryl refusing to listen to Lance. And that is for the scene where he goes and helps uh, Aaron and Gabriel. Because clearly in that scene, Lance forces them to uh, go and kill those walkers because uh, he doesn't believe them that uh, uh, those people left them alive after killing Toby. Uh, and he thinks that uh, they actually knew them and it was maybe some of their people, like potentially Maggie was the one who did those stuff. He probably doesn't realize about the existence of like Negan's group, uh, but uh, he I guess very much knows that Maggie was involved at the end of the day. So I just love how Daryl, uh, despite the fact that he was, he's like a soldier, he's supposed to follow orders and everything, he still just goes right beside him and just goes and helps Aaron and Gabriel. I love that. Um, next thing I've written is, there are some really nice kills in the last two episodes. Yeah, we definitely, uh, the kill of Toby was like one of the most satisfying deaths of a villain in a while. Like, if we compare it to other recent deaths, um, Alpha's death was kind of underwhelming. It makes sense from a writing standpoint and I get what they were doing with it. I just feel like the way specifically she dies, while again being, being a very poetic death because Negan was sliced in the throat the same way, just doesn't hit hard. And also it's poetic because she killed uh, all those people in the same way. Um, for Beta's death, it was so fucking underwhelming how only for like Five seconds he fought Negan, then Daryl comes uh, in, slices him a little bit on the side, and then stabs him in the eyes. It's pretty brutal to stab him in the eyes, but it should have been a longer fight. It just feels way too short. Then there is uh, Pope, who wasn't even killed by our main characters. He didn't even have one scene with Maggie. So much for Pope marked you. It was, he was killed by Leah. And Leah didn't even get killed. And for the scene where Maggie was killing all the different Reapers, Reapers and stuff, um, it was meant to be satisfying. It clearly was um, made to be a really impactful moment, but it really wasn't. And when she stabbed Carter, uh, Carver in, in the heart, it, again, it just felt lame. It didn't hit hard. Because of the way it was shot, we didn't even really see the blade hit him. Instead, we saw it before and after, which is just lame. So, seeing Toby getting shot by Aaron and falling to his death, and we even see him uh, hitting the ground and then getting eaten, and then he, he's seeing his uh, eaten body, just, it's so satisfying. It's why I watched The Walking Dead, for the satisfying deaths, the gore, and the characters, but also those two things. And for the last few seasons, it's only been the characters that has been carrying the show for me. Um, the next thing I've written is Mercer's name is Michael. 
I definitely did not see uh, that coming. I actually didn't know uh, that he had a first name. Like, I thought his first name was, like, Mercer. But no. Uh, so that means that his name is Michael Mercer. And Max's name is Max Mercer. <laughs> I love me some transliteration uh, in the names, man. It always makes characters sound so badass. That's why even uh, the main character of my zombie story, Dead Inside, uh, name is a uh, transliterated name, which is like Hope Hartfield, where both the first name and the uh, uh, second name start with the same letter. Like Daryl Dixon! Huh? Not every name uh, needs a transliteration uh, to be badass, though, because there's Rick Grimes or Negan Smith. Which just sounds lame. <laughs> um... Next thing I've written is, Maggie looks guilty as fuck. And I pretty much went over this um, already. She very much looked guilty. Like, if I was Lance, I would call her bullshit on that. Like, I would tell her, like, why do you look so guilty if you haven't done anything? I would call her out, because it was so bla blatant. Um, next thing I've written is, manipulating a kid? Really? Um, which... Definitely felt a little bit low, even for Mercer, to kind of try to manipulate that kid into telling him the truth. But I'm glad that Herschel actually wasn't a dumbass, so he didn't tell him uh, anything. Next thing I've written is, Daryl said, fuck, that was so badass. And indeed, it was. It was really badass. Um, next thing I've written is, Ezekiel's dead. Now I'm sure of it. And I'm pretty sure that I wrote that uh, when we were at the speech towards the end of the episode where he was talking to Carol. How uh, some of us are carrying the weight because we're strong enough to hold the weight for those who can't. And that was honestly a pretty good speech and I'm pretty sure they used that in the trailer. Uh, one of the trailers at least. Um, and I like it but it definitely felt a little bit Gimpo-ish. To show me in a speech like that, but it really felt like it was telegraphing the fact that he was gonna die. He's gonna die at some point. And the final thing I wrote for this episode is Leah and Hornsby, huh? Because I definitely did not see uh, the Commonwealth uh, Leah working with the Commonwealth in any way. And again, I'm still not sure whether she is gonna go after Maggie or whether she's gonna be going after Pamela. Everything is pointing towards Maggie because it just makes sense because this whole storyline has been. Maggie's storyline kind of with her so why would she care about Pamela but then like I said The Walking Dead loves to do fake outs where they make you think that they're going to be doing this but in fact they're actually doing this and it, it it's like both in the walk in, in character for The Walking Dead to go after Pamela while making us think that it's she's going after Maggie and it just also makes sense from a writing perspective for Leo to go after Maggie. But yeah, I don't know. Overall, it was a pretty satisfying episode, although it it was very much an episode that was like moderately. It was like for the most part very low, and then it was uh, uh, got a little better, and then it kind of went down a little bit. Like it definitely peaked kind of in the middle with that Darrow scene, but. Uh, compared to the previous episode where I feel like it was a consistently, relatively consistently high uh, entertainment value for me. So yeah, um, I don't remember how I rated last week's episode. Uh, right now I would give it a 9.4 out of 10. But for this episode, I feel like I would give it probably something along the lines of 8.4 to an 8.6 out of 10 at most. Maybe, you know what, no, I'm gonna give it an 8.7 out of 10. I think it was a pretty decent uh, and entertaining episode, but it definitely had some weaker parts there. But it was a fine episode, I definitely uh, enjoyed it. Although, there's definitely moments of the episode that uh, uh, feel as low as 8.4 out of 10. Because if you ask me, like, the, the average of all the storylines in this episode are kind of an 8.7 out of 10. Because, like, the more boring stuff that I didn't really care much about, like, uh, uh, the Connie, Kelly, uh, Eugene, Max, and Rosita stuff, I didn't really care about them too much. Like, it wasn't that entertaining. Um, the Mercer and Princess stuff wasn't that entertaining. So those two things are more towards the 8.4 out of 10. The Daryl stuff are, like, a 9 plus out of 10, like with the stuff with at Hilltop and with Lance. 
Uh, and then there's uh, Ezekiel and Carol's story in this episode, kind of in the middle of like an 8.5 out of 10. So ultimately it kind of goes close to a, like an 8.7. I don't know. It was a fine episode, but it definitely was weaker. Like the trend continues. But that means that next week's episode uh, is going to be really, really entertaining. So, yeah. What did you guys think about this episode? Comment your thoughts down below and let's have a discussion about it. And also, before we end this video, I just want to give a huge shout out to my currently three patrons on Patreon. Omar Bidman, Deadpool and Shenches. Thank you guys for your support, I really appreciate it, it really means a lot to me if you have decided to support me, you have continued to support me for such a long time, hope you continue to enjoy my content and continue to support me going forward. Thank you very much. And now, before we end this video, I just want to talk about something uh, to you guys very quickly, um, which some of you may or may have not noticed before or know about me, that being the fact that I am trans. And yes, this may come uh, as shocking uh, to some of you because I don't really flaunt it that much on my channel, or at least I feel like I don't. Um, outside of like my K-pop reactions, which is where I feel like the most comfortable being myself like this. And yeah, I am in fact trans. Um, I'm not necessarily full on uh, male to female, but I heavily want to transition to being pretty female. I do consider myself more non-binary though, or maybe gender fluid would be the best descriptor as well, because I do have occasional moments where I feel fine being like just a normal guy, but most of the time, like right now, I do feel very dysphoric. Um, and that's why I'm asking you guys for any help that you can give me, because my situation right now, I, I don't really see any way out of outside of you guys' help because and this is gonna be kept short and concise I live with my parents they're never going to accept me as a trans person they, they just never will and as a matter of fact back when I started the YouTube channel I was actually kind of slightly starting my transition back then with like starting to grow out my hair um, I even got to DIY HRT, but because my parents started noticing certain things like uh, uh, my behavior had changed a lot and my clothes had changed a lot, I kind of had to stop doing that because they were constantly nagging me about cutting my hair and just started to kind of be threatening in a certain way and felt like they were ashamed of me and everything and that just kind of that kind of stress just tired me out to the point where I just gave up but as dysphoria goes it just doesn't go away you know I still feel like this and in fact it's somewhat been intensifying again recently so I just wanted to share this with you guys and again I would really appreciate any amount of support you can give me in regards to this because um, I just don't see any way out of this because even if I mo uh, moved out of my parents house and got my myself a job and everything that's just not gonna work for long-term uh, planning because once I transition it's like I probably will not be able to get myself a job because my country is very transphobic nobody gives a shit about LGBT people at all so there's not even much I can do even in terms of transitioning here. So yeah, I don't know. I just would appreciate any amount of support you can give me, uh, be it monetarily or in any way otherwise. And this is not about uh, boosting my channel or anything or guilt tripping you with my sob story. I just wanted to get this off my chest and make my subscribers aware of the situation that I am in and that I would appreciate anything that you guys can help me out with. It would mean literally everything. Like for example, uh, a friend that I made after starting this YouTube channel, my good friend Yuri, has been helping me out a lot. And I genuinely might have not been here if it wasn't for him, if it wasn't for him showing up and befriending me. So yeah, this just went a little bit longer than I, I intended, but I would just uh, really appreciate anything you can support me with. That's kind of ultimately what I'm trying to say. 
And yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if you did, please leave a like, subscribe. Also, check out the links in the description to my Twitter if you want to follow me over there and to my Wattpad where I post my stories. Because in addition to doing all these videos on my channel, I'm also a writer. And if you haven't enjoyed my stories or simply enjoy my videos, you can head over to my Patreon or to my Coffee account where you can pledge your support and help get the channel going, help support me so I can keep writing stories you enjoy. But if you don't want to do it, that's completely fine. You can see help me out in other ways like liking this video, subscribing to the channel, and especially sharing this video with someone who you think might enjoy it. And I think this is pretty much it for this video, so hopefully I'm going to see you in the next one. Bye!